Find the schematic. So, I'm John Biggs. Does this work? Ah, there it is. I love these things because you can do this. You can like shoot lasers and stuff. I'm John Biggs, East Coast editor of TechCrunch. Uh, I'm a writer, I'm a realist. I hate a lot of stuff. I'm exhausted most of the time. Um, you can download my book right there. That's a slash C. That's a book that I wrote about blogging. You guys can have that for free. I give it away and nobody ever downloads it, so it doesn't really matter. So it's almost like I'm not giving it away. And you can also download my head. Uh, it's a, it's, if you go to this, this thing right there, that's my head 3D scanned. So you can have me uh, as for your own. And you can print me or whatever, and then you go over to Zortrax and they'll take care of you. So what do I do? I'm a, uh, I originally started at Gizmodo, which was a gadget site. I think there's a Polish version. I, I was an IT guy before that. I hated it. I became a journalist, well, got a master's in journalism. Then I went to work at a place called Yellow Rat Bastard in New York, which is a clothing store, and I hated that. And then I decided to become a journalist. So I worked at Gizmodo, where we talked about gadgets. We talked about hardware. We talked about Samsung. We were upset if we didn't get into a press conference from Nokia. It was a really big deal back then. And this was like 2004, back when people gave a shit about Nokia. Um, you guys are just like, it's, it's like a church in here. Let's, let's do a little, let's give ourselves a round of applause. You guys are very patient. Just be happy. Look, you guys, it's like this, it's like this dead, these d thousand yard stairs. Maybe everybody drank too much. All right, so you guys are great. Smile, everybody's, everybody's fine. We're going to be okay in this. I'm, I'm actually making this shorter for you guys so you guys can go to lunch. Uh, so back when Nokia actually mattered, and back when Microsoft mattered, back when Samsung mattered, uh, that's, when we were, that's when Gizmodo started popping up. And we used to do 28 posts a day, and then we did 50 posts a day about gadgets, about stuff that just came out from these big companies, these big corporations. But over the past couple years, it's been much easier to put the means of production into the hands of entrepreneurs, the means of creating cool stuff. And just to show that I'm not making shit up, I've done it before, and I'm going to be doing it again soon, but this is a... Uh, come on, dude. There we go. So this is, my, this is another book that I wrote just now. And I wanted, to be, I, wanted to make, I wanted to make sure that this stuff was real, that I, what I talk about is actually real. And what I decided to do is I decided instead of making a piece of hardware or an Arduino board that can, I don't know, scratch your pet for you, I decided to write a book. So this is my book that I did. I crowdfunded it, uh, did $20,000 in crowdfunding, printed it myself, did everything myself. And I realized that, yes, this is true. And this is, a, this is a big change in the way we think about product. This is the big change in the way we think about the way we work. So find the schematic. This is my dad. As you'll notice, I, I learned a lot from my dad. This is a book of poetry, uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti's uh, Coney Island of the Mind. I also learned how to drink a lot of beer from my dad. He taught me that. Actually, I learned that myself over the number of years, and it's, it's, a, it's been a hard lesson, really, to, uh, to get over. Uh, I also learned to be, uh, whatchamacallit, take selfies. This is probably one of the first selfies. This was, this, he used a, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen these. It's, a, it's like a box that takes pictures. Like right now we have the phones, but they used to have these boxes with like holes in them, and then it would shoot light into the hole, into the hole. You guys, no, it's, it's like, it's really old, right? You could shoot a light into the hole onto a piece of film, I guess they called it. It's like a piece of paper, and it, what came out later, like months later, was like a, was like a, like a photograph. And it's, it's amazing stuff. I don't know how they did it back then. Uh, and he's also very pretentious in this photo, and I'm also very pretentious, so that's what the, uh, that's what else it tells you. So this is my dad. And back when I was a kid, we had a walkie-talkie, a little radio thing. It was broken, and I figured we needed to try to fix it. So he said, we're going to find the schematic, and we're going to fix it. And this was back in the 80s, back when the dinosaurs still roamed the Earth, and the NES was popular. And he said, we're going to find the schematic, we're going to fix these walkie-talkies. I'm like, what the, what the hell is a schematic? It's like we're going to discover like, the secrets of the universe. We're going to find the schematic, and we're going to discover how this walkie-talkie works in relation to all the other walkie-talkies in the world. And we're going to discover 
that if you do this to the walkie-talkie, you're going to do, you're going to improve it, you're going to make it better. But what we really meant is, is if you open things up, inside you would find all this junk. This is electronics. Uh, we don't see these anymore because we can't open any of our stuff up. Uh, and on the top of this, you would find this manual. And this is a amplifier unit. And inside the manual, you would have the schematic. And look at this. Can you imagine if we had to find the schematic for like a for a iMac? This is a crazy radio, amateur transmitter. You got a bunch of electronic stuff here. Uh, this that's the that's the scientific term. There's a switch over here, a little ground, uh, another switch, some other junk. This curly thing. We we I don't even know what the hell all this is. It's just crazy. I mean, who who knows all this stuff? But apparently, my dad did, which is which is a, which was amazing to me. And what he wanted us to do is he wanted to open the damn walkie-talkies up, look inside, and find out that all you needed to do was just swap out a resistor or a transistor or a, uh, or a switch and make things better. And you could do that back in the 70s. Because the, you didn't have Best Buy back in the 70s. You didn't have uh, Merlin or whatever the stores are here. In fact, the internet wasn't even around until like, this is whatever, 1993 or however. Well, I don't know my history. Um, but you couldn't go online, you couldn't figure all this stuff out. You had to have the schematic built in, and you had to build your own stuff. So you had to sit there, and you had to solder all this crap together. And this isn't, it's, it's all right, it's, it's a lot of fun, and, but what did you really make? You basically made a thing that right now is a chip inside of our phones, and it's not even, it's, and it's probably cost two cents to make the chip, whereas this cost about $120 in 1975 money, which was pretty badass. And the only way to get electronics is to buy something called a Heath kit. So this is a Heath kit, and these are the uh, these are schematics. So I would argue, and in my experience at Gizmodo all the way over to TechCrunch, we've moved from staying outside of the box, from being afraid of getting inside the box, from being afraid of controlling the box, to finding the schematic finally. Getting inside, people are going to tell you, you don't want to get inside these things. It's, it's pointless. It's outmoded, it's outdated. It's, uh, it's unpopular, but it's not. I would argue that this is not dead yet. This is an important thing right here, this C prompt, the ability to see what your computer is doing, the ability to have a general purpose computer that can do anything that you can control, that you can rebuild, and that your product is, the same, is controlled the same way, that you have a general purpose product that you're trying to control, that you're trying to build from inside. So how does this relate to all you guys? This relates in that people are getting inside more and more things right now. Five years ago, ten years ago, you couldn't do this. It was very, very strange. It's a very, very strange change in the way we do marketing, in the way we do manufacturing, in the way we do programming. Uh, ten years ago, marketing was a one-way street. You put up a billboard, you made a, you made a, whatchamacallit, you made an advertiser, an advertisement on, on TV, and you just said something to somebody, and you're expecting them to listen to you. Drink Coke, and okay, we'll drink some Coke. That's exactly what we're going to do. Now, one of my favorite things to do is to retweet all those stupid, like, brand announcements. Like when, like, Kraft Singles says, like, try some Kraft Singles on bread. And then I always retweet it, but I change it, like, try Kraft Singles with roaches on bread. So it looks like Kraft, Kraft is, is tweeting that they should, they're encouraging you to put roaches on your sandwiches, which is funny to me. And it's, I'm literally the only guy who it's funny to. But I'll, I'll, put, I'll put like Hail Satan in, uh, in, some, in some of the tweets and just retweet it, and it, it's really enjoyable. Once I said that, uh, I think it was like, a, like Pringles or something, I said that my cousin almost died eating a Pringles. And they got, really, they got really upset, and they like, started tweeting back at me, like, is your cousin okay? Can we not? Can we not? <laughs> like, no, Mike, I don't have a cousin. He died from Pringles. <laughs> that, would be, that, would be, that would be a terrible way to go. Actually, it would be a wonderful way to go if you sat there eating some Pringles. If you're a manufacturer, again, back in the Gizmodo days, we didn't have any control over what, what we were going to post. Samsung ran the conversation. They said, oh, here's a new shitty phone. You better write about it. And we did it. We were just we were all we were all for it. I was really really happy to do that. Right now, Samsung can't even. I, I won't even take their calls. 
uh, because I know that all they're trying to do is they're trying to be a shark. They're basically, if they stopped making phones, they would shut down. And if Apple stopped making computers, they would shut down. They have to keep putting out this, putting, pushing out this garbage, this closed garbage. And I don't want any part of it anymore. I'm done with it, which is why I like this kind of stuff. Gizmodo and Engadget still exist, obviously. And there's still pe plenty of people out there who, give a, uh, who care about the latest Android phone. Um, but I would argue that that's changing very, very rapidly for these guys. And these guys know it. They know that they're, they're up against a, a group of people who don't want to deal with upgrade cycles of six months or four months or even two weeks if, you're, uh, if, you're in, if you buy something pr improperly and it, and it breaks and you have to send it back. And also understand that as a programmer, your code is transparent. Now, if you recall, back when there was Atari 800 XLs, uh, most of the code was machine code that you couldn't actually see. It was already compiled. You could feasibly decompile it. You could feasibly crack it. You could get in there and figure stuff out. But what you didn't have is you didn't have access to the HTML code. You didn't have access to JavaScript or JScript and all this other crazy stuff that's actually being sent to the browser, pushed to the browser, unobfuscated. You can read it yourself. You can take it. And now we've created this whole web of ideas. Uh, if somebody over here made a, made a button that that, I don't know, slowly appears on the screen. Now you can take that idea and put it on your, on your website. And people understand that, and people, people expect that. That's a culture of openness. You can't just sell a product anymore. You can't just sell a closed item anymore. There we go. So you have to kill your black boxes. What happens when you make a black box? So there are a couple examples that I'm going to give you. There's kind of a nerdy... <laughs> there she is. Uh, is kind of a nerdy example. So if you can, if you know uh, C, this was where was this in? It was in a uh, it was in a login portion of in Linux. And if you read this, and because Linux is open, you can read this. If you read what happens here, uh, this is a it's af it's asking if these options are here and the current UID equals zero then you essentially set another value to einval. But what's actually happening here is that it's actually setting the user ID to root. And when you run this code, you're setting the user ID to root. Now, the fact that I'm bringing this up is that in, mi in Microsoft Windows, you have no idea if this thing is happening anywhere. There could be a piece of code that sets you to a super user or can format your drive in 15 seconds. Because Linux was open, you, they were able to find this about five years ago and realize that, yeah, we're not gonna, our computers are going to explode if we run this code. And they fixed it pretty quickly. So that's one of the benefits of openness. This, was a, this wasn't a black box, but this is what could happen inside a black box. You don't know if OSX has this code in it. We don't know if anything has this code in it. It could be a mess. There's another black box that was pretty cool. This is called a QCAT. And um, I don't know if you've, give, you've seen these. They're like these, uh, these things, like they're, they're made out of paper, and you put, there's words on them, and we don't have them in the States anymore. And they're like, they come out every month. I think they were called magazines. And back when the web was very young and beautiful, uh, the magazines were convinced that they were going to make it. They were going to make it through this whole horrible thing. Uh, I think you guys do still have magazines, because for some reason. Um, but the QCAT was supposed to be a thing that you would ru run over like a, a barcode inside a magazine. And you sit there in the, in the, with, the, with, this, uh, with this barcode, and it would type a URL in for you onto your browser, because it was very, very difficult back when this thing was popular, back in about 99, to type in a URL, because nobody knew how to type www, apparently. So these guys thought they were going to just bring magazines to life. They were just going to change the way magazines were, were used. And this was a fairly cool thing, because it was a uh, UPC reader, uh, for free, that you got for free, just by sending, sending an email or some, something, or sending, ordering it from these guys. And then you, would, you could just swipe your magazine, you could go to a URL. And magazines, magazines have since disappeared. Um, but the QCAT you can still get on eBay. What they did with this QCAT is they took this black box and they hacked it, they reverse engineered it, they figured out how it's going to work. And they turned it into a UPC reader just generally. So you could put your books in there, you could, I don't know, do your wine collection, you could, I don't know, scan in all your pornography, and it was amazing. 
And, but the QCAT people didn't want that because they got a million dollars or five million dollars or whatever kind of investment they got to build these pieces of crap um, to, build, to work with marketers instead of hackers who wanted to steal their, their product. And that's exactly what they did. They broke the black box, they opened it up, and they destroyed essentially a business. And QCAT's no longer in business. I don't know where those guys are. Finally, this is the ultimate in black boxes. This is a, <laughs> this is a tale of woe. So look at this stuff. So this is my old iPad mini. This is, this is sweat right here, like hand sweat, if you can imagine what, the, what I was going through. And my hands naturally sweat, but this was, like, this was like it was pouring off. So I'm trying to get the screen off. I cracked the screen in the corner. I didn't crack it, the kids did. Uh, don't ever have kids, incidentally. <laughs> um, so this is where it cracked, right here. And if you can imagine, what I had to do is I had to pull this off and you had to put these little picks in there to make sure that it would, didn't close up again because it's all stuck together with glue. So what you do here, what the experts do, uh, and I consider myself an expert, what the experts do is you start pulling this off with suction cups, you crack the outer screen. Then when you think that you're done, you realize that you have to get underneath the inner screen. So if your inner screen is fine, that's great, uh, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna crack the shit out of the inner screen too while you're trying to get underneath the inner screen to disconnect it. So you're gonna have two crack things instead of just one, which improves, <laughs> which improves your odds of cracking other stuff immensely. So ultimately I cracked those two screens, then I got another screen in, from eBay, and I tried to put it in, and because I'm an idiot, I cracked that screen too. <laughs> then I, uh, and then I finally got it all together. I don't know how the hell I did it. Actually, I think my buddy did it for me. Um, and then it didn't work. So this is the ultimate in black boxes. And I'm not, I'm not singling out Apple here, but I am. But I assure you, if you try to do the same thing with your Galaxy S5, you'd have, you'd have the, same, the same pain uh, intrinsic to your, in your life. And it would be just very, very, very it's a obvious, it's horrible, horrible experience. Because you just know that, oh, I'm gonna do this thing, I can do this. And then you can't do it. And then you, and you cry. And you sweat. See how much, look at that, it's amazing. I never realized that there was sweat all over this screen. But this is what happens when you've killed your black boxes, when you've opened everything up. This is my Bitcoin mining operation. I, I like to say I'm a, sort of like a little, a little Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, if you'll notice, if anybody knows Bitcoin mining, I'm running at a pretty fast 700 giga hashes per second or whatever they do. Uh, that, will, that nets me, and I'm not, I'm not bragging here, I'm just telling you guys, I get about 25 cents every five months with this rig. <laughs> so, I'm, I, can, I can get you guys dinner, it doesn't matter. Because it's all just Bitcoin money at this point. 25 cents, imagine that. But the beauty of this thing is I can do it. I did it myself. I plugged all my little, my little doodads in and fired up Mind Peon, which is an open product, ran a bunch of open source stuff, and I'm making money. I mean, that's, that's probably what Linus Torvalds actually wanted to do back in, the, back in the 90s when he first started Linux, and then he realized he wasn't going to make any money, and then he went to go work for chip companies. But this is important stuff. This is changing the way we think about money. This is another thing that I just saw today. So this is a, uh, this is a micro, this is a Game Boy Micro, or Game Boy Mini. Now, this is a new Game Boy Mini because what they've done is they've torn out all the guts of this. this, is, this these are the original uh, switches, and this is the original case, but they tore out all the guts, and they put a new screen in, and they put a Raspberry Pi inside this ga Game Boy Mini. And all you have to do is go online, and you can figure out how to do this yourself. Am I going to be able to do it myself? Absolutely not, because as you noticed before, when I built that, uh, when I took my iPad apart, I destroyed it. I'm sure this would just catch fire as soon as you turned it on for me. But maybe you guys are better than me, and I actually, I know that. This is an example of what happens when somebody essentially supplants the way somebody manufactures something. This Nintendo had no intention of allowing you to take out all the guts and put in a new computer and put in a little chip that has 5,000 games on it, and bingo bango, you got, a, you got a very handsome Game Boy that plays exactly the way it did back in, the, back in the 80s, plus you have all the Sega Genesis games on here, plus you have all kinds of other crazy games on here, plus you could probably even feasibly put arcade games on here, which is pretty badass. If you told me that you could put arcade games on a Game Boy Mini back when I had a Game Boy Mini, when I was very, very young and, uh, and far more handsome, I would have laughed at you. 
and I would have, but then I'd also have had a huge uh, erection because that would have been amazing uh, to a young, young child. Would I have, no, I don't, I don't know when I was sexually aware. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of rough. All right, anyway, next product, another black, another open black box. This is called Monsieur. These guys I met in Atlanta. Uh, they were a bunch of engineers at, uh, I think it was Georgia Tech. And they built a machine that makes drinks. Now, as an alcoholic, I really enjoy this because what you do is you go up to this screen right here, you type in your little thing. You'd notice my hand shaking? That's my alcoholism. Uh, the, the uh, whatchamacallit, you type, you press a little button, and then a drink comes out. And you press another button, and another drink comes out. And you just keep doing it until, until you're dead. And that's the best thing in the world. If they, Leaving Las Vegas would have been a very, very short movie if, they, if Nicolas Cage had had this. Um, but what he did is he took an open tablet, Android tablet, put some kiosk software on top of it, bought a bunch of motors and an Arduino board and a microcontroller, and now he's got a thing that makes drinks. It, whereas you'd be, before you had to hire a bartender, now all you have to do is just wheel this up and you can just talk to this machine. He'll, be as, he'll probably be as, as attentive as a bartender and, uh, and make your drinks and, and slowly kill yourself. So that's another value of being open. So where am I going with this? I think we have like 12 hours for this, so I'm going I'm to give you, I'm going to go really long and just really drawn out. I want you guys to think about in your own businesses, marketing, if you guys are doing entrepreneurial uh, efforts, if you guys are building um, cool stuff inside your big company, if you're stuck inside, who's stuck inside a big company? Anybody? No, none of you guys are. This dude, but you, look at you. You want to get out? You want to come out of it? <laughs> Does anybody have a job for him? <laughs> you, do you, are you enjoying your big company? You do? Is it, what is it, like car washes? What, what does it do? <laughs> computer programs, same, same kind of thing. But eventually you're going to get tired of your computer programming job. And this is, how to, this is how to pep things up a little bit. You make an environment for making. And these are some examples of how people have made environments for making and have been successful. Livebolt, 3M, and Quicken Loans. Livebolt is a company that it was just basically three dudes. Uh, very small for a very small company. Their idea, their initial idea, was some kind of thing that you put on your wall, and you hold your iPhone up to the thing and rub it on the on the wall, and then it'll know who you are. And it was a really, <laughs> it's a really bad idea. <laughs> and uh, they they were nice enough guys, but they were doing a hackathon at TechCrunch Disrupt a couple years ago, and they didn't know what to do because they wanted to use their technology, which was awful, which was. Uh, which is acceptable, and, uh, but they had no idea how to use it. So I had, an elect uh, I had an electric imp, which is like a little Wi-Fi thingamajigger that I gave them, and I said, I, somebody just gave me this, why don't you guys use it? And suddenly they realized, oh, I can do something amazing with the product that we already have. I can make a door that opens by itself. So they created a, they created a thing called LiveBolt. They used their goofy little iPhone thing, they connected it, it's, God bless them, and that's a good idea, and, uh, and they pressed, and they, but they also added this Wi-Fi component, so you could open your door from your phone, and they set it all up, and they actually brought a door on stage, they went out and bought a door at Home Depot, and in a couple days, actually it was 24 hours, they had a product that people actually wanted, and they went on to do some crowdfunding, and I think they did really well, and now there are a couple of these guys who are trying essentially the same idea, but just because you had this very, very small electric imp thing, you could attach that to it, put that inside a box, add a battery, and you've got a product that works and you can sell. And you couldn't do that five years ago. You couldn't do that 10 years ago. But these guys did it in 24 hours. Another uh, company that made an environment for making, I'm not sure if they do it anymore, uh, but they, they did 15% time back in 1948, just about after the war. Because what they realized that all these engineers who were in the army, they didn't want to listen to some jerk in a suit tell them what to do. So they had all these guys who were, probably had P PTSD and were exhausted, and they came to work for 3M, and they wanted to, go, they wanted to do cool stuff. So they had 15% time. You could take 15% to do whatever you wanted to do, to do research projects, to, I don't know, write a symphony, to dance. I'm not sure if that was, if that was a thing that they did, but I'm sure it would have been fine. I could, you could dance in 1948, I guess. Uh, and what came out of that in 1974 was probably 3M's most popular product, which is the post-it note. 
And everybody knows the story of the post-it notes. Some dude had a little bunch of papers inside his, inside his court, like his music book, because he used to be in the chorus. And all the papers would always fall out, so he needed some kind of glue. And he went in 15% time, hung out for a little while in the lab, found a glue that was sticky and remained sticky every time he pulled it off. And he made the post-it note. And now he's probably not rich, but 3M is. And this is a, this is a thing. You pr this is, probably looks familiar to you guys. This looks like a, this looks like a hipster -like loft where you guys go, you go, go to work and you also go to play because you also have a ping pong table in there. I'm sure there's a ping pong table right around the corner. This is very familiar to us because we've seen this over and over again. But what this is, this is in the heart of downtown Detroit. Now, downtown Detroit, you could, f you could literally film a zombie movie in downtown Detroit and nobody would notice. You could just have hundreds of them just walking down the street. And nobody even, it wouldn't bat an eye because, oh, look, there's another guy with sores all over his face walking in downtown Detroit. And this is a Quicken Loans. So these guys have created this environment for making. They have an entire floor dedicated to Skunk Works projects. If you want to make something for yourself, if you want to do something cool in hardware or software, you go to this floor and you hang out with these programmers and you, and you build something cool. And they let you do that. They want you to do that. Because what, else you, what, el what everybody else is doing is they're sitting on the phones trying to sell mortgages to people who don't want to buy mortgages. So unless you do that, uh, those guys are going to jump off the building onto the ground here uh, so you give, them an, you give them an outlet, you give them a way to escape the day-to-day -day drudgery of working at Quicken Loans. And this is, actually, this is actually working very well for them. What they've created is sort of this cauldron thing that I like to call it. Um, they're at the center and they've created these little offshoots, all these little groups of startups around their main company. And these little startups actually have access to all the, all the resources of Quicken Loans. Now, Quicken Loans is a rich company. So they have computers, they have, they have customer lists, they have phones, they have HR, they have travel. Uh, they have all these great systems. And these startups can just connect to Quicken Loans, just like an umbilical cord, and get all these resources. And then eventually, Quicken Loans buys them and brings them in and hires them, uh, which is actually what that is. It's sort of like this tech washing thing that these big companies like to do. They're essentially looking for engineers the engineers don't want to go work for Quicken Loans, but they will go work for a startup. So if, startup, if Quicken Loans hi buys all these little startups, they can hire all these engineers for just about the same money as it would cost to recruit them, which is a very interesting thing that's happening right now. So there's plenty of people out there who are going to say, yeah, we're going to give you $2 million for your startup. And they're essentially paying you a salary of $2 million, destroying your startup and forcing you to go work for them, their computer company. So think about that next time, you, uh, next time somebody wants to buy you. So here's the how-to. Here's the quick thing. This is what, this is what computer, computer, big computer office guy can do. This is what you can do. All of you guys, I don't know what you guys can do. You just hang out. Uh, you hold internal hackathons. These hackathons are extremely, extremely important to get all your groups together. You can hold external hackathons as well with some of your competitors. One of the things that I've been trying to do, and I think I'm going to be doing this like, over the next couple years, is create a hackathon where everybody gets together and um, you bring a bunch of marketers together, you bring a bunch of advertisers, you bring a bunch of um, designers, all in the same room. And you put them in front of two or three horrible startups. And there's lots of horrible startups out there. But these, these startups need some help. So the marketers are going to help them with their, with their marketing collateral. The uh, designers are going to help them with their website. The programmers are going to help them do these, do these different things. So it, so it sort of helps everybody grow. The guys who had no startup experience can work with them, with startups. And the startups who have no money to pay anybody get free help for about 24 hours. And the best one, the one that gets changed the most from beginning to end, wins this competition. So I'm trying to figure out where to do those. So you hold these, you hold these sorts of hackathons. You could also hold the hackathons with your competitors. Why not? I mean, it's not like you guys are have any like, intellectual property you have to protect. So. But as long as you get together and as long as you explain, these are the rules, these are the barriers, these are the ground, this, this, this is where we can work, then uh, you can actually pull this off. 80 20 your best workers. I know it's hard if you're a tiny little company and you, don't, you only have like three guys and one guy is, doesn't sleep, it's hard to 80 20 that guy. But there, if you're in a big company, you can 80 20 people. Publish your source code when you can. So this is also hard for people to understand. Uh, Proprietary source code, there's a very short window when you want to keep your, your source code proprietary. 
uh, open source is important when the program you're writing isn't important at all, when it's like a script, and when it's massively important. And there's a very small window when you want to keep that, that IP closed. When it's massively important, you want to make sure that people can audit it. You want to make sure if it's a, if it's a, crypto, uh, if it's a cryptography uh, program, you want to make sure people can audit it. People can take a look and see what's going on inside. Uh, and you basically sell services based on that. If it's, an op if it's an operating system, you want to make sure people can get in there and figure stuff out. And you can feasibly do that on Microsoft and, and OS X, but you can really do it on Linux. And that's why Linux is very, very popular right now, because you can know that if you install this stuff, it's not going to destroy your computer, because you can see what, it, what it's doing. Uh, there's a very small window when you want to keep things closed. And a lot of companies have said, we're going to keep everything closed forever and ever and ever. And what you get out of that is you get a company that doesn't understand the difference between open and closed. Uh, recently, a lot of the financial ind uh, industries had this big turmoil because some of the, the fast trading guys left to start their own companies. And one of the guys brought with him a bunch of open source code. And most of these trading systems, if they're not written in Microsoft Access, then they're written, they're written using JBoss and a bunch of queries and all this other crazy stuff that anybody and their dog could just recreate just because all this stuff's open source. But the financial companies said that all this stuff was closed source. So they stole all this open source information, they put it on their computers, and as soon as they steal it, they put a little header on the top that says this belongs to JP Morgan or whatever. And they started charging, they started suing these people for taking code that was essentially open source that anybody could download anyway out of the company. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even closed code. So you can go far, far too far on the other side. And you use the tools that makers use. You can build a maker bar for yourself. And this doesn't involve beer, this involves Arduinos. This involves books, which are these things made out of paper. Uh, you open them up and there's writing inside. Uh, or you offer ebooks, which are computerized books on paper. I'm just I'm talking to the choir here. You guys know all this stuff already. You bring in Raspberry Pis. You bring in those goofy little Game Boy Micros and say, everybody, hey, we're all going to make Game Boys right now. And you create little projects. And didn't we always love to like, do little projects at school? And what these things do is these teach you how to think outside of these black boxes, how to understand that, yes, the stuff that we're doing is important, but there's an entire world out there that can make the stuff that we're doing sticky. Hardware makes software sticky. And experiencing the way hardware works and experiencing the way new web services work and experience the way new languages work makes our brains stickier and makes our brains more... We can pick things up a lot quicker and we can understand how these things work. And I, I, want, I, do, this, I do this just myself at home and I enjoy it. Because if I had to sit there and write about startups all day, I would probably kill myself. And I, I've tried many times. Um, <laughs> but that's why I enjoy using Raspberry Pi. That's why I'm trying to tell you. That's why I'm talking about this stuff. Because it's an important thing to, th to, to understand that we, five years ago, you didn't have this opportunity. This didn't exist. The Raspberry Pi was just a couple years ago. Um, Arduino just came, in, just came into popularity. Now anybody can open the box and build stuff. ABB, this is, my, uh, this is my motto, always be building. This is going to say building right here. We're just going to close. That says building underneath there. I didn't, I didn't get my Photoshop out. Always be building. Whether you're programming, whether you're designing, whether you're taking photographs, try to understand what has changed in this space. You can build an entire company just because some dude gave you a little Wi-Fi dongle that makes stuff that, that makes your, your product work much, much better. You can, you can change the way your, biz, your business works by, opening a, a, by creating SDK and an API and opening things up a little bit and working with outsiders to help you essentially jumpstart a lot of the stuff that you're doing. Another reason why I like finding the schematic is because back when Heathkit was popular, you had this kind of advertisement. And this sort of sure tells you what can happen if you guys follow all the, all the mantra of always be building. Look at these people. Look at how happy they are. This, the girls with like a belly shirt and this dude with a perm. And look what they have. They have a robot and a computer. And back in, back in the 70s, a robot and a computer was pretty badass stuff. I mean, it doesn't even matter that they're wearing bikinis and they're on the beach with these robots. 
in computers. And she's still, she's, I, don't, I have no idea. I think this shirt is as big as this guy's shirt. I don't know how they did that. I think maybe she just has a longer waist. But this is what you guys can have if you, uh, if you open your black boxes. If you start trying some of these things, start using the tools that makers use. You can have this wonderful experience of being on the beach with a robot and a computer. Or you can have the wonderful be experience of being in your office with a robot and a computer. Or you can build all kinds of amazing things, and you can share them on stage later on. You can go to Hackathon, and you can change your business overnight. And it sounds like a bunch of bullshit, and it, mostly it is. But I've seen it again and again. The tools that makers use right now are helping small businesses and bigger businesses change very, very quickly. And that's all I'm trying to say to you guys. So I'm John Biggs. This is my email address, at John, biggs at c.cc or john at TechCrunch. You can email me if you have any questions or if you have any stuff that you want to pitch. Thank you very much. I think we're good. You're more than good. Do we have time for questions, or should I just yeah, get, no, get the no, we'll out take of here? some questions actually, because I mean, unless you don't want to. No, that's all right. I like these guys, <laughs> and I'm sure there's a lot of questions because you're the most attended speech this morning. Okay. A lot of people here, so I'm opening the floor. Just raise your hand if you have a question. I'm sure you do with with John, and I don't see the lady with the microphone, but I assume she's here somewhere. Please raise your hand. First questions. Who takes it? Come on, guys. Don't be shy. He's only a guy from TechCrunch. <laughs> Here's know. one. Where is the microphone? Oh, here. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, she's. What did you think of your uh, Indiegogo experience? Um, I became the best spammer in the world. That was a good. That was a good time. I have, another, I have another presentation. Everybody wants, I, I have like three or four presentations. I could have given another one. I could feasibly give another one right now about the Indiegogo experience. But I've discovered that social selling is bullshit. There's no way to sell anything in social. It doesn't work. You, whatever, you, whatever anybody tells you, it doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, email, direct email, is the best way to get somebody to press a, to press a button, no matter what. Because what do you do in Twitter? You press, you know, all you can do in Twitter is like something or, or retweet it. And you think you're doing somebody a favor, but you're not. So if I say, come to my website and buy my amazing thing that turns dogs into cats, you're never going to sell a single one on Twitter. It's, I assure you, if, even if you have a thing that can, that can, uh, that can turn dogs into cats, it's not going to work. Uh, so yeah, that was, one of my, that was one of the things that I learned. Uh, email works, spamming. I became the best spammer in the world, or the worst one. Um, and that uh, people will give you lots of money for really stupid ideas. So that's another, <laughs> that's another benefit. You can take that away, too. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's not a stupid idea, but it's, it's true. Anyone else? I love, yeah, I remember getting your tweets, your Facebook, you like your, whatever, that, your book. You? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, after a while. And I finally bailed because last night I downloaded your book. Yeah, you finally See? bought it. See? Yeah, but because you were there, so you but saw I me. just gave it to you guys. But if you didn't write down that URL, you're not getting it again. So maybe, or if you come up to me, I'll, I'll give you one. <laughs> Next questions, please. Come on, guys. Hello. We can just oh, chat. There's, just there's a, there's we someone just on the side. Thank you. Otherwise, we can just chat between you and me. Hello. Thank you. My name is Peter. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, you said a lot, uh, a lot about uh, how the startup, which startups makes you laugh. So uh, maybe you you give us some hints which which don't actually. Which or maybe not, not particular, but what, what features of the startup makes you interested? Why, why I get interested in a startup? Yeah, well, in, in tech or in, like, yeah. like in a business. Or just like in, in writing or just about as a tech crunch yeah, well, guy? Technically, or a, I would like you to, to write some of, of startups which I'm running. So about you. So asking, you want yeah. me to write about you? Yeah. Well, no, not me, you know. But, but just generally. So you yeah, want me to write about nice. you specifically Could and you do about that? everybody else generally. Could you do that? Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll write about you. You, okay. you just you, that's 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 all you got to do. See, it's really easy. You just email me, John at TechCrunch, J O H N, and then we'll we'll set you up. See, he just he just won the he just won the prize. I don't even know what it is. It's probably Actually, like it's probably a thing that turns dogs into cats, and it's going to be amazing. Yeah, it's even worse. No, what I'm what but no, the question was quite serious. You know, like what makes you interested in in things what are on the market right now? Well. 
talk about watches and he will listen to you. Yeah, you could do that. But think, think about it in these terms. There, there are a lot of ideas out there. And one of, the, one of my goals is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's why I don't care about Samsung anymore. That's why I don't care about Twitter that much. There are other people on staff who, who care about that, and God bless them, they're, they're happy and they're doing what, what needs to be done. We need to put that information up anyway. We need to know what Facebook is doing to change advertising by ruining Facebook. Um, what's important to me is that there are people who are building cool stuff in out-of-the-way places. That's why I go around the world now uh, giving speeches like this and trying to talk to people to figure out what people are, what people are building. Because... What's happened is Silicon Valley has gotten really, really spread out. It's very, very flat now. It's everywhere. So you have this thin layer of entrepreneurial excitement almost everywhere in the world. I've been to, I've been to the Balkans. I'm sure if I went out to Armenia or wherever, I'm sure they've got 200 people in a room who are just listening to the exact same speech and really excited about building the next, uh, I don't know, web query thing. And this is very important because we're in a, we're in a situation where this is one of the major engines of a future economy, all these little startups. A lot of them are going to fail, obviously, but the sheer fact that there are so many people who are into these things and who are building these things uh, with an intensity that's amazing is just great, and it's really changed the way I, think I look at the world. So one of, my, one of my, the things that I look at is I look for a really cool product that does cool stuff, could be a service, could be a piece of hardware, and that's out of the way, that, isn't, that may or may not get a lot of attention locally or even worldwide. If I can be the guy who brings that to the forefront, then I'm a happy man. That's really all I want. Thanks.